I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm probably won't whistle, but. <laughs> All right, if I could invite you to make your way, pull yourself away from um, the morsels and the food and the drink, I promise you will be rewarded in other, with the other senses besides taste. Well, uh, as I said earlier, um, this is, it's been six years since we've had Ken Myers uh, back with us, but it is a privilege to welcome him back. Um, he, uh, the, by way of introduction for him, uh, he ha- once has told uh, several of us, I think, over the years that he has the gift of bibliography. He is a, uh, he's got a voice for radio. He might tell you he has a face for radio, but he definitely has a voice for radio. If you have not subscribed to the Mars Hill Audio Journal, you should do that. Uh, some of you have received a Mars Hill Audio Journal subscription gift from me. Um, and we've even gotten together, some of us, and talked through some of the, the journal and the Friday features. I highly commend that to you. Um, Ken Myers is a, a wealth of information and pleasure, and it is going to be fun. He is going to take us through Luther's... Um, contribution and connection with Bach. So uh, please, uh, without making him feel any less embarrassed than John Hodges, welcome Ken Myers. Thank you. you. Before I begin, uh, I'll mention also other uh, media that I'm involved with in addition to Mars Hill. I I write a column on sacred choral music for Touchstone magazine and uh, it's amazing that they've allowed me to do this for years Uh, and uh, it's been a a discipline for me to write this bi-monthly column and spend time uh, digging into historical and uh, aesthetic questions about sacred choral music that uh, so, something that I have a, a, an affection for and uh, uh, an experiential involvement with. I've been singing uh, uh, serious choral music since I was in my early teens. Uh, so anyway, Touchstone uh, has uh, those columns every issue. I uh, actually am trying to finish my next column, so I'm kind of distracted with writing about Josquin de Pre. Uh, And I kept thinking about Josquin instead of thinking about Luther as I was working on this lecture. Uh, Also, I'm a music director at my church and maintain a website uh, for music education in our parish, but uh, other people are allowed to look at it. It's canticasacra.org is the web address. And uh, I've posted some of the older essays from Touchstone there, but it's kind of a hodgepodge of uh, recordings uh, we have finished recording uh, the, the entire Psalter in Gregorian chant with the Coverdale Psalter in English. It's the only space on the interweb that uh, includes the entire Psalter in English, uh, but Gregorian chant. So uh, uh, anyway, that's something else. Um, as John was lecturing, I realized we're coming in sl- a slightly askew, which means we're not going to collide, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but to help you kind of connect what he did and what I did, um, I've been lecturing for the last 12 or 13 years on, on music and meaning. Uh, in fact, I think the first lecture I gave on that topic, I, I entitled, How Might Music Mean? Uh, very similar concern. So I, 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 and uh, one of the things I was eager to r- rebut is the claim that m- that meaning in music is purely conventional, that that m- that music is in- inherently meaningless, and we just assign what we want to to it. And um, and so uh, I- I've been eager to to rebut that. Um, but I think it it is helpful to remember all that that our perception of musical meaning. Uh, is uh, is not insignificantly shaped by by conventions. The conventions, that is, uh, the the the, the, uh, 
traditional ascription of meaning. Uh, the conventions are not uh, entirely arbitrary, but, but we do uh, receive musical meaning in history. Uh, and so th the conventions that have been established are not irrelevant to our perception of meaning. Um, uh, an example of this, uh, towards, the end of, towards the end of this talk, which I may not finish until tomorrow, because <laughs> I may pick up where I left off tonight. Uh, we're going to look at one of Bach's chorales, uh, Christ Log in Todesbanden, which is uh, an Easter uh, hymn that Luther wrote. <clears throat> Bach converted the seven stanzas of the hymn into a seven movement cantata. Uh, Christ lay in death's dark tomb, uh, or bonds, the bonds of death. Um, powerful Easter hymn. So years ago I was at a church in a Holy Week service on Maundy Thursday and the organist playing soft poignant music during communion I suddenly realized he's playing Chris Log and Todas Bond. Well I realized he wasn't a very theologically alert <laughs> or liturgically alert organist uh, we'd gotten him from the roller rink, actually. To, uh, no, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> it was the Holiday Inn, actually. He'd been playing. <laughs> and he knew the title, Christ Lay in, in, in the Bonds of Death, didn't realize that that's just the first line of an Easter hymn, and, which ends with Alleluia's, joyous Alleluia's, because he's not in the Bonds of Death anymore. But he's playing this Melody, of course, no, no words, but a melody which has been associated not just since Luther in 1524 set it to that text, but he borrowed from a, a Gregorian chant melody that's very similar that was also an Easter hymn. So for at least probably a thousand years, that tune was an Easter tune. And you don't just bring it out on Maundy Thursday. So there's an example of how Conventions shape perceptions, and, and meaning does accumulate around musical forms. Again, not entirely arbitrarily. Uh, another example, I think this is, it's a little different, but it's similar. Uh, that is a, a recognition of, of the history of meaning that's attached to something. I, I, when I worked at National Public Radio, Many years ago, um, I had the pleasure of working for several years with the poet John Ciardi, uh, who actually wrote a book called How Does a Poem Mean, I think. Um, and Ciardi was really interested in the etymology of words and the origins of English uh, phrases, uh, not just... Uh, words themselves, but, but idiomatic phrases. And he, he told me once, uh, he was teaching creative writing, I think at Rutgers, and uh, he had a, a student who had written a, a short story about a, a transatlantic voyage, and there was a sentence that said, on, on June 14th, we arrived at the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And Charity said, no, 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 you can't, you can't use the verb arrive it comes from Ariv to the shore. You can't come to the shore in the middle of an ocean. <laughs> so, and, and he said, you know, the, the word Ariv carries with it this, this he says, uh, I think it's Emerson who says that words are fossil poems. They kind of, they, they have embedded meaning within them, uh, even in their etymologies. And the best poets and the best preachers, I should say, uh, have that etymological History. They know the history of it. So while we might say arrive is perfectly good to use in that sentence, uh, it, it, it loses, it, to use it is to uh, ignore the traces of meaning that it carries with it. And what I want to do in the, tonight and tomorrow is to look particularly at 
how traces of meaning are sustained in Bach's work, how he's profoundly aware of where these tunes and words have been in the life of the church as he uses them. And that, moreover, his listeners, the congregation, particularly the congregation in Leipzig, who heard most of his cantatas, were profoundly aware of where those tunes and texts had been. And he could insert a tune without even needing to use the words because they knew the theological associations that were present uh, with that tune. That's uh, a, an awareness that we don't all have, but if you're interested in understanding Bach's music better, you need to try to cultivate the awareness, and cult there are lots of ways you can cultivate it, not just through study. I, in the last couple of years, I've been trying to listen to, Bach wrote most of his cantatas to be sung on particular Sundays or feast days in the church, tied to the gospel reading that was appointed for reading in that, in that time. My church uses the uh, 1928 Book of Common Prayer, which fortunately has the same gospel and epistle reading for each day that, that Bach was using. So uh, when we read a gospel, uh, when our gospel reading and epistle reading for the coming Sunday, the fourth Sunday after Trinity, I can listen to the cantata Bach wrote for the fourth Sunday after Trinity and, and get another sermon. Uh, if I didn't really like the one, I, oh no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, earlier, is John here? John? No, not that John. The, the John organist, John Hurd. Yes. Was this one of the 18? Is that what it's called? So he played a chorale prelude, uh, and are there, there's another setting of Kom Heiliger Geist in that set, in that series, isn't there? He played this marvelous performance of one of the earliest of Lutheran hymns, Kom Heiliger Geist, uh, Come Holy Ghost. Uh, it's not only one of the earliest, it's one of the shortest <laughs> Lutheran hymns. Lutheran hymns are notoriously long. Seven stanzas is kind of average, 14 stanzas, whatever. This is a three stanza Lutheran hymn, which is almost a contradiction in terms. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to say a little bit to segue from, from his wonderful performance of that work. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very enduring Lutheran chorale. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about chorales and the role they have in, uh, in, Luther's, uh, in Luther's liturgical reforms, but, uh, but working up to uh, the role that they played in, in Bach's work. Um, just a little, little factoid. Uh, there are about 1,100 pieces of music in the Bach catalog, complete works. Over half of them are either based on chorale melodies or include some uh, presentation of chorale melodies. Uh, and uh, I'll talk more about the, why that's a remarkable thing for Bach. Uh, so, so to understand the Lutheran chorales and the role they had in the life of the church and where they came from is really, uh, uh, I think, imperative to understanding uh, understanding Bach's work. Now, the first stanza of Kom Heiliger Geist um, was written by an anonymous German poet, first published around 1480, which was before Luther was born. Uh, it's a rough paraphrase of a Catholic prayer which dates back at least to the 11th century. Uh, a, a paraphrase in German. It was not used liturgically, but it was used devotionally. And here's an English translation of that stanza. Come, Holy Ghost, Lord God, fill with the goodness of your grace the heart, spirit, and mind of your believers. Kindle in them your ardent love. O Lord, through the splendor of your light, you have gathered in faith people from all the tongues of the world, so that in your praise, Lord, may there be sung, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Now, Luther liked this poem and uh, felt that it would make a wonderful hymn for use in the church in Pentecost, something that was singable by the congregation uh, and not just by clergy and choir. So he wrote two more stanzas, uh, and he seasoned the second stanza with his characteristic commitment to truth about salvation. Here's the second stanza. 
You holy light, precious refuge, let the word of life enlighten us and teach us to know God truly, to call him Father from our heart. O Lord, protect us from strange doctrines. Yeah, that's Luther. So that we may never look for any teacher except Jesus in true belief and may trust him wholeheartedly. Alleluia, alleluia. And in the third stanza, Luther's pastoral side emerges. You sacred warmth, sweet consolation, now help us, remain, help us always to remain joyful and comforted in your service. Do not let sorrow drive us away. O oh Lord, through your power, make us ready and strengthen the feebleness of our flesh so that we may bravely struggle through life and death to reach you, alleluia, alleluia. Now this is far from the most famous of the Lutheran chorales, uh, but it was one of the very first to appear in print, 1524. Uh, I was thinking as I was working on this talk, uh, we, in 1517 many people celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. 1524 is the big year. That's the 500th anniversary of the publication of not one, but two Lutheran hymnals that shaped music profoundly. Um, and they were small works, but uh, remarkable in a number of ways. The first, the one was published in Wittenberg, the other in Erfurt, and uh, uh, the, the Wittenberg volume contained only 32 songs uh, the Erfurt volume, 25 or 26, depending on which edition you bought. And both hymnals included the text of Come Heiliger Geist. And more notably, they included the melody that, that Luther adapted. Once again, he's always adapting stuff. This melody he adapted from a, sixth, a 13th century predecessor for use with this text. And it was a tune that had stuck with that text until today. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I have to confess that the first stanza of that hymn was sung uh, by an octet of voices at my wedding. Uh, and, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and I can't remember if it was before the pastor said, you may now kiss the bride or after. I'm <laughs> sorry, I can't remember. I know it was right before the recessional. Uh, and uh, here I'm going to play a, uh, I couldn't find, I couldn't find uh, an earlier setting, uh, 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 earliest setting I could find, uh, earliest simple setting of this was by uh, Johann Hermann Schein, a great German Lutheran composer who uh, lived from 1586 to, to 1630. And here's his simple four-part uh, arrangement of Komm Heiliger Geist. Oops, almost there. So, anybody know that tune? Uh, sung it? Is it in hymnals? Is it? Uh, do you know if it's in any? I don't know if that tune is in many hymnals right now. Uh, it's it's actually a little bit more, a little bit longer than most than the average chorale, I think. Um, 
And again, this is, this is a simple chorale setting from a composer who lived almost exactly 100 years before J.S. Bach. Now, I, I mentioned that the melody for this was in that first Wittenberg hymnal of 1524. But what was also in that Wittenberg hymnal was a setting for four voices, but uh, only for uh, trained professionals on a closed track. This, these were, <laughs> this was complicated, well, not the most complicated polyphony, but, uh, but it was intended to be sung by a choir. And I'll explain later how Luther balanced congregational singing in unison with choir singing of pretty complex polyphony, which is what Johann Walter, who was one of Luther's colleagues and collaborators, who uh, helped edit these two 1524 hymnals. Uh, here is, I, I, I finally, I realized, oh, I have a recording. I was searching for recordings. I realized, oh, I have one. Uh, you buy music online, and if you don't get that booklet, you don't know who the composer was. So I had a, compo uh, a composition. I had to do some research to figure it. This is, in fact, Johann Walter's uh, first setting, which was in the They're going to sing another verse, but we'll stop. Okay. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that Luther was promoting music like that for use in worship, even as he was trying to get... And that's not uh, an overstatement. Uh, it, congregations didn't take to singing hymns right away uh, from the best scholarship we have. Um, you know, I always thought that on October 31st, uh, Luther nailed the theses to the door, and then on November 1st, they all sang A Mighty Fortress, right? <laughs> and they're just so excited, finally, we're free, we can sing hymns. But it took decades to get congregations to sing hymns. Sometimes it still takes a long time to get congregations to sing hymns. But the impression is that he was a, a, a democratic populist. This is awfully elite music. What, what, what's this doing in, with the Luther brand on it? And, and moreover, why is he plundering 15th century sacred poetry and he's stealing 13th century hymn tunes and encouraging such complex music to be sung in evangelical worship? Uh, a common assumption about Martin Luther's musical practices is that he ditched the entire musical treasury of Christendom in favor of cool pop tunes that he heard in taverns. Uh, in fact, uh, if, if, if I succeed in nothing else in these two talks, I hope I can disabuse you of that pernicious and misleading myth. It's just not true. Uh, some time ago, I was... Uh, sharing a meal with a group of Christian professionals, including uh, a man who was a prominent federal judge at the time. And he was telling me about the church that he attended on the West Coast and how much he appreciated the various ministries of the church and particularly the preaching. And after a wistful pause, he said, the only thing I don't like is the music. And then he shrugged as if that didn't matter much. Well, I asked him why he didn't think that was important, and he said, well, that's only culture. I gagged on my food. The Heimlich maneuver ensued. <laughs> uh, 
Now that's a really common attitude that I, I've spent a lot of time trying to, uh, trying to rebut, that, that, that somehow the experience of faith is detached from culture. I think it's based on some theological assumptions that are rarely made explicit. I think at some level it probably presupposes a separation of, rede- of redemption from creation. It separates the work of Christ in delivering us from the dominion of sin from the work of Christ in making all things and in holding all things together. It fails to understand that salvation has a cosmic dimension. It doesn't situate the forgiveness of our sins with with God's plan for the fullness of time, which St. Paul describes at the beginning of the letter to the Ephesians as a plan to unite all things in Christ, all things in heaven, and all things on earth. Culture is is the term that we give to describe how human societies order their lives together in light of their best efforts to perceive and do justice to the meaningfulness of created things. Culture is an expression of what we make of creation. Our efforts to make and do beautiful things are enactments of our connection, uh, 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 of uh, our conviction that beauty is a real aspect of creation and even a real attribute of God. After all, our salvation is not the abandonment of our humanity and all of its patterns of engagement with creation. Our salvation is the rescue, the restoration, the recapitulation of the good and beautiful human habitation. In Isaiah 45, we read that Yahweh is the creator of the heavens and the one who shaped the earth and made it, who set it firm, and as the text says, did not create it to be chaos, rather he formed it to be lived in. Creation is habitable. Creation with all of its details and particularity and harmonies was a gift to Adam, the context of which It was the context in which the ramifications of his humanity were to be fulfilled. Oliver O'Donovan describes our sinful waywardness as our acting to uncreate ourselves and the rest of creation. But when the power of sin is overturned, it's the resurrection of Christ that's present as a central event. It's the resurrection of the man Adam, the universal man, the last, excuse me, of the man Jesus, the universal man, the last Adam, who retains his humanity forever and thus restores creation's possibilities of fulfillment. So I think rightly understood how we engage creation in cultural pursuits is not an insignificant or superficial concern. It's just not, it's not just cosmetic, it's cosmic. Our worship cannot address God as redeemer without acknowledging God as creator. It's false to express gratitude for the amazing grace that saves us, but meanwhile, act as if creation, including the gift of our very life, is somehow a neutral or meaningless or self-actualizing thing, something that just happens to be there. If we encourage wonder at God's love in rescuing us us from sin, but nurture indifference at God's love in making all things good, we perpetuate a dualism that ends up separating faith from life, which I think invites the living of everyday life as if God doesn't exist. Now the events going on here this week, I assume, are directed with a strong commitment to affirming the integrity of faith and culture, the unity of redemption and creation, and it's profoundly fitting that these talks are named after Johann Sebastian Bach, a man whose astonishing cultural accomplishments were achieved just as the Enlightenment's momentum was building. Because I think the Enlightenment begins to create a chasm between faith and life that there were already cracks in the West uh, that made that chasm, uh, in a sense, uh, predictable. But... uh, it's, it's during the time of the Enlightenment that, uh, that the chasm uh, becomes much more uh, profound. Bach, uh, in addition to being sung at my wedding, <laughs> uh, 
uh, engagement with Bach's music has, has had a profound uh, impact in my life, uh, beginning in my early teens, in orienting my understanding of the connections between faith and culture. And especially in more recent years, I've continued to appreciate what Bach accomplished and how he accomplished it. What he accomplished and how he accomplished it cannot be understood without appreciating the way that Martin Luther approached the reform of the liturgical life of the church. Uh, Luther's influence on the life of the church formed the ecosystem in which Bach's singularly astonishing feats of imagination were nurtured. And those events are not something in the past. They're recapitulated every time we sing or play or hear a piece of music. Uh, remarkable expressions of beauty, which are the result of discoveries made hundreds of years ago, can become an abiding experience for us now if we attentively and actively receive the gifts that they bring us. Attentiveness and receptivity are essential virtues for living wisely, but they're also essential postures for listening to music fruitfully. Her classic study, Feeling and Form, philosopher Suzanne Langer described musical hearing as a special intelligence of the ear and one that's only acquired through exercise. And she warned, and she's writing in 1953, before we had smartphones, uh, she, she warned that multitasking, that's not the word she used, um, multitasking was a sure way to learn not to listen. Here's what she wrote. People learn to read and study with music, sometimes beautiful and powerful music, going on in the background. As they cultivate inattention <laughs> or divided attention, Music as such becomes more and more a mere psychological stimulant or sedative, which they enjoy even during conversation. In this way, they cultivate passive hearing, which is the very contradiction of listening. Langer goes on to say that people who have cultivated passive hearing, what I sometimes think of as active non-listening, often confuse enjoying music with enjoying themselves during music. <laughs> music can be in the background while you're having a good time, but the structure of the music, the form of the music, the form that the music's meaningfulness takes uh, may have little or nothing to do with the nature of the pleasure that you're experiencing. Now, as it happened, attentive and active Receptivity is a good way to describe what Martin Luther wanted to encourage via the changes to the liturgy that he championed. Luther was driven by a zeal to announce the gospel as the good news of the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, and he believed that the gracious nature of salvation was obscured in some of the details in the way the Mass was celebrated. Robin Lever, who's written quite a bit about Luther and music, as well as about Bach and, mu and uh, Bach's music, Lever summarizes Luther's concerns about early 16th century liturgy this way, quote, the action of the mass in traditional thinking was of humans making an offering to God. But for Luther, the movement was entirely in the other direction. God's gift is brought to us. For Luther, therefore, at any celebration of the Mass, the work of God in Christ must be given prominence in proclamation and action. Quote. In receiving that free gift, worshipers are not passive or unconscious. They're to actively receive what God is giving them in a spirit of gratitude, wonder, and joy. As Luther himself wrote, quote, the whole power of the mass consists of the words of Christ. And he's using mass here in a good way. He did not abandon the use of the term mass, as I'll mention in a minute. The whole power of the mass consists of the words of Christ in which he testifies that forgiveness of sins is bestowed on all those who believe that his body is given and his blood poured out for them. This is why nothing is more important for those who go to hear mass than to ponder these words diligently and in full faith. Unless they do this, all else they do is vain." Close quote. 
It was promote this diligent pondering that Luther insisted on one of his most dramatic reforms of the liturgy, which was increasing the amount of congregational participation in the mass, especially through the singing of hymns. The title of Robin Lever's 2017 book on Luther's reforms is called The Whole Church Sings. Congregational singing wasn't just a culture, uh, wasn't just a kind of pragmatic way to encourage mindless enthusiasm. It was a way of involving everyone in liturgical action. There were to be no spectators, no audience, uh, no passive observers in the rituals of worship. While believers can do nothing to gain their salvation, they are all to participate as one body in praising the Lord that has saved them. Composer and musicologist Carl Schalk has commented, quote, for Luther, worship could no longer be viewed as something done by others on behalf of the people. Worship was seen, rather, as the people of God, the assembly of royal priests exercising their common priesthood in praise, proclamation, and prayer, both on their own behalf and on behalf of the whole world, close quote. So the recovery of congregational singing wasn't a de-ritualizing of worship into an informal sing-along. There's a, there's a danger, I think, of us reading our, our kind of uh, democratic habits of thought and practice back into what Luther did. Oh, he wanted the congregation to sing. That means, and it's a priest of all believers, that means it's entirely egalitarian, populist, democratic. Uh, I, I, that wasn't what Luther had in mind, for sure. Um, it, it, Luther's reform and involving the whole church was not, didn't mean that everyone got to do everything. Uh, they weren't Quakers after all, right? <laughs> it was still a structured liturgy. Well, maybe that's everybody gets to do nothing. I don't know, a snarky Quaker joke. It was still a structured liturgy with certain actions done by the clergy and even certain music sung by trained choirs. Unlike the later Puritans, Luther did not do away with all of the rituals and traditional trappings of late medieval worship in favor of a streamlined prototype for modern evangelical worship, which often includes just a few hymns to kind of warm people up for the main event, which was the sermon. Nor, as is commonly assumed, were the hymns that Luther introduced derived predominantly from popular music of the day. When I mentioned to a friend at our church that was going to be speaking about Luther's use of liturgical music, he asked, didn't Luther adapt a lot of drinking songs for use as hymns? The short answer is no, no. Now here's the background for that short answer. Lever, Robin Lever, who I quoted before, has a wonderful book called Luther's Liturgical Music, and he explains in that book, quote, what was at issue, according to Luther, was not music itself, but how it was used. If it was performed merely in fulfillment of the demands of unreformed ecclesiastical law, then it was to be condemned. But if it was performed in response to the gospel, then it was to be commended. And then here's a quote from Luther. After faith, we can do no greater work than to praise, preach, sing, and in every way laud and magnify God's glory, honor, and name. It's important to keep in mind that unlike many of the other reformers, Luther retained more in the liturgy than he eliminated. Karl Schalk has written that Luther's approach was to retain from the past whatever did not violate his understanding of the gospel. And Schalk says this was not a flight into wistful nostalgia, but rather, and this is a very interesting point, a pastorally responsible attempt to demonstrate the continuity and unity of Lutheranism with the church Catholic. He wasn't inventing a new religion. And the best way to make that clear, he was a reformer, not, not a, 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 an in, a, a, a total innovator. The best way to do that was to retain things that were not that it was not necessary to dispense with. Uh, Luther's introduction of congregational singing in the vernacular, in, in, in his case German, is often lauded as being pastorally sensitive. But in fact, I think you could argue that the fact that he retained so much of the mass and especially retained Gregorian chant and complex choral music was also pastorally sensitive. Uh, it, it, it was a point of contact 
with, uh, with the church's history, uh, as well as being uh, capable uh, modes of, of expression of, of prayer and praise. I mentioned he, he kept the word mass uh, for what many would call today a worship service. Mass is the English word. The G Germans use the term messa, and the Latin is misa. Uh, the Latin word is traditionally spoken in the phrase at the very end of the mass, ita misa est, literally go, it is the sending or the dismissal. It's just you're dismissed is essentially what the final phrase was. Uh, and the term misa got appropriated for the entire uh, liturgical action from the beginning to the end. In 1525, Luther published an order of worship called the Deutsche Messe, in uh, the German Mass, and Robin Lever argues that this document, quote, is one of the most important liturgical documents of the Reformation era. Now, before going on, I think it might be helpful to describe the components of the Mass as Luther knew them, uh, and, and as they're still in use in, today in many liturgies. Uh, the Mass, first of all, is always a Eucharistic service. Uh, there were other services in the life of the church that included prayer and song and, and not the Lord's Supper, but the Mass was where the Lord's Supper was, was uh, celebrated. And in the Mass, there are certain fixed texts that are always chanted or recited. Uh, they're each a form of prayer, and taking together these fixed texts are called the ordinary of the Mass. Um, and every musical setting of the Mass includes these elements. John said there's six. Yeah, there are five or six. <laughs> five or six. There's one pair that, that, that is usually almost always kept together and... and, and kept together musically as well as textually. Uh, let me re recite these. This will be on the quiz, so you'll want to make note of this. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't use slide. I, uh, I talked to Jared about using slides. I say I want to help people be better listeners, and if I they use slides, they, they, they're not challenged to listen closely. Here are the five elements of the Mass. The Kyrie, which is a Greek word for Lord, is the uh, opening movement. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. And usually those three phrases, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, often, usually those three phrases are repeated three times. So you have a nine, nine phrase. Kyrie, 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 Christe, 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 Kyrie, Kyrie, Kyrie. And that's, you'll hear that in a lot of musical settings uh, of the Mass. So that's the first section. And it's the only section that's typically sung in Greek. Uh, the rest of it was in Latin. The second section was the Gloria, which usually, which, uh, a text which begins with the words of the angels at the time of the nativity, Gloria in excelsis Deo, glory be to God in the highest, uh, and then goes on from there. It's one of the longer sections of the Mass, Followed, uh, the glory is followed by the, the, the credo, or the creed, which is essentially the Nicene Creed. Uh, the fourth movement is, is the pair of the Sanctus. We heard of Sanctus earlier. Sanctus and Benedictus. The Sanctus is the words from Isaiah, holy, holy, holy. Uh, and then uh, the Benedictus, uh, blessed is the man who cometh in the name of the Lord, is that right? And they both close with Hosanna in the highest, typically. Uh, so we have words from Isaiah and Matthew. And then the last is the Agnus Dei. John played part of an Agnus Dei earlier, which is a prayer for God's mercy based on John the Baptist's declaration, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus Benedictus, and Agnus Dei, the five elements of the ordinary of the Mass. Now, but there's more, as they used to say on television ads. Uh, there are certain elements of the Mass that vary from Sunday to Sunday and on special feast days, and these are called propers because they are proper to a particular, uh, a particular day. Um, 
Most of these propers are short texts from Psalms, just sometimes just a verse or two, some from other biblical sources, sometimes rarely from an extra biblical source. The first of these is the introit at the very beginning of the Mass. And then there are two propers uh, between the reading of the epistle and the gospel reading. And those are called the gradual and the alleluia. During Lent, you don't sing alleluia, so the alleluia is replaced with a tract. The tract isn't something you hand to strangers. Uh, It's it's a a, a text. And then there's uh, another short text sung during the preparation of the elements for communion called the offertory. And finally, there's a proper called communion, which is chanted during the distribution of the elements. So there are four propers in the Mass, introit, and then the pair, gradual alleluia, which are sung back to back. Offertory, communion. Five ordinary elements, four propers. Now, there's lots, lots more in the service. There's traditional read, uh, there's a schedule of readings, an epistle reading, a gospel reading, there's the Lord's Prayer, as well as a number of other prayers and declarations from the clergy and prayers, uh, prayers of the people. Now, the ordinary and the propers are the most musically significant part of the Mass. Uh, and when composers began setting more ornate musical settings of the Mass, they only set the ordinary. Partly because if you set the propers, you could only sing it once a year. <laughs> Uh, so the ordinary can be sung at any, at any mass. Uh, but there were chants, there were chants in the Gregorian books. There were multiple settings of the ordinary of the mass in Gregorian chant, and there were settings for every one of the propers. So there was a lot to learn. Now this body of music d- began developing pretty early in the church's history. And it's not until, what, the 12th century we have notation, 11th, 12th century, somewhere in there. When you could write music down and you didn't have to learn it all by memory, that just relieved an incredible. It took years to learn how to chant all of the propers for, you know, you had four or five texts for every Sunday in the service and and multiple variations. Uh, So it was a, a, a huge repertoire not to mention in the, the monastic orders, they're chanting the psalms, usually chanting the whole way through the Psalter once a week. Uh, a, a more chants to learn. Um, now, back to the Mass. Among the prayers that were uh, recited by the clergy during the preparation of elements, there's a section of prayers known as the Canon of the Mass. It's C-A-N-O-N, which contained the Eucharistic theology that Luther felt was most problematic. And as Robin Lever writes, Luther, when he created his own evangelical mass, quote, he only eliminated the offertory and the canon and left almost everything else unchanged, including monodic chant, what we think, what we think of as Gregorian chant. He kept a lot of chant and he kept a lot of polyphony, multi-voice choral singing. Uh, but, as Lever says, with the proviso that the gospel should be preached so the celebration would not be interpreted as a function of law. Again, when he published in 1526 his Deutsche Mass, he made it very clear, I'm not saying you have to do this. I don't want to impose a Lutheran law. This is how we're going to do it. This is a wise way of doing it. Uh, It's tricky to institutionalize wisdom, (laughs) but it's a necessary human thing to have traditions. And, uh, but he was very careful not to say, you know, you have to do it this way. And, and, uh, and it it was a, the Deutsche Mass was revised and it, it, I don't think it was received as law. Uh, he didn't want people to think, well, as long as you perform all these ritual actions, everything's hunky-dory. But he did say, this is a wise way to do it, and, and we're going to do it this way. 
Here's what Luther himself said. The first step is to let the old practice continue. Let the mass be celebrated with consecrated vestments, with chants and all the usual ceremonies in Latin, recognizing the fact that these are merely external matters which do not endanger the consciences of men. But besides that, through the sermon, keep the consciences free so that the congregation may learn that these things are done not because they have to be done that way or because it would be heresy to do them differently as the nonsensical laws of the Pope insist, close quote. Now, around 1530, Luther expressed very explicitly his positive appreciation of the musical portions of the Mass uh, that, that he had taken over from the unreformed church. Here's it's a remarkable Statement: I believe that many hymns were included and retained in the Mass which deal with thanking and praising God in a wonderful and excellent way. As, for example, the Gloria, the Alleluia, the Creed, the Preface, the Sanctus, the Benedictus, and the Agnus Dei. In these various parts you find nothing about a sacrifice but only praise and thanks. Therefore, we have also kept them in our Mass, particularly the Agnus Dei, above all songs, serves well for the sacrament, for it clearly sings about and praises Christ for having borne our sins and in beautiful, brief words, powerfully and sweetly teaches the remembrance of Christ. Now, in this passage, he's speaking principally about the texts, but as we'll see probably tomorrow at this point, not later tonight, uh, he was very appreciative of the musical styles traditionally, we could stay late, uh, traditionally used in the late medieval church, and he strove to sustain those styles. When he introduced hymns to be sung by the congregation in German, he didn't get rid of choirs, he didn't get rid of cantors, he didn't even get rid of Latin. If, if, if this church was in a city, they, they still had services in Latin because educated people knew Latin. In fact, they, many of the churches had parish schools called Latin schools. <laughs> And so to teach the kids Latin during the week, uh, it, it made sense to help them hone their understanding of the language uh, and worship in it, to be bilingual. Um, in fact, I've, I've, I've uh, spoken to a lot of classical Christian school conferences and say, you know, you, people, do you ever teach kids to sit? They should know the words of the mass in Latin, your kids, because there's nothing uh, uh, any good Protestant should object to. And, I mean, you're singing the Nicene Creed in Latin. Well, that, let's start there. Okay. You have, you have a school here, right? Okay. Uh, he, he, he wanted more, he wanted more German hymns early on, but he, he had pretty high standards. He said, I'm only going to use more German hymns if I can find competent poets to write them. And if we don't, we're going we're to use some of the Latin texts that have traditionally been sung. Now, uh, since Luther single, singled out the Agnus Dei, I, I want us to sing a setting of the Agnus Dei, and then we're going to sing another Lutheran chorale as we close. You have in your handouts on the first page, O Lamb of God Most Holy, and this text and tune are from uh, a, a rough contemporary of Luther's, Nicholas Decius, who uh, wrote other chorale melodies that Luther used. Um, <clears throat> rather than just translating the Latin text from the traditional mass into German, uh, O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. That's a literal translation. Notice what Decius does. O Lamb of God, he amplifies the text. This is a good Lutheran habit you'll see in a lot of the chorales. O Lamb of God most holy, who on the cross did languish, was patient still and lowly, though mocked, Amid thine anguish, our sins by thee were taken, or hope had us forsaken. Have mercy upon us, O Jesu. And again, you sing it three times. You sing it the first two times with the 
with the first line at the, on, uh, on, the, on the bottom staff, and then the third time you sing, Grant us thy peace today, O Jesus. This is a rough English translation of Decius's. But th this is a common, this was done very commonly in the chorales where Luther would take a text and amplify it, in, in, often with a kind of pastoral and, and often catechetical end in mind. So let's sing this, and uh, that's a good way to end chapter one in our discussion. Um, now, oh, you get extra credit on the quiz if you can tell me when Bach uses this chorale melody. Okay, uh, we'll see who knows that. Okay, I'm going to sing it through relatively quickly just to give you a sense of the melody. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who could sight read it here, but just for, I don't want to. Uh, mm, that's actually uh, an F. Let's take it. It's late. Let's go down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's how the melody goes. O Lamb of God most holy, who on the cross did languish, was patient still and lowly, though mocked amid thine anguish. Our sins by thee were taken, or hope had us forsaken. Have mercy upon us, O Jesu. Now, those of you who can sight read parts, feel free to do that. We will not do any polyphony based on this melody. Improvising a fugue, perhaps. No, we won't do that. So let's, uh, let's sing this a little bit slower than that. And we'll sing all three stanzas. The first two are the same. Sec and the third one has that last line. Mm, ready? O Lamb of God most holy, who on the cross did languish, who was patient still and lowly, though mocked amid thine anguish, our sins by thee were taken, or hope had us forsaken. Have mercy upon us, O Jesu. O Lamb of God most holy, who on the cross did languish, was patient, still and lowly, though mocked amid thine anguish. Our sins by thee were taken, or hope had us forsaken. Have mercy upon us, O Jesu. O Lamb of God most holy, who on the cross did languish, was patient still and lowly, though mocked amid thine anguish. Our sins by thee were taken, or hope had us forsaken. Grant us thy peace today, O Jesu. Thank you. We'll pick up tomorrow uh, and we'll look at all the other. Please try to bring these back if you come back tomorrow. 
uh, so we don't have to print up lots more. And we'll look at uh, some of the other corrals, including uh, L Luther's setting of the uh, uh, Lord's Prayer. His, uh, as you'll note, these are the f just the first four stanzas of the Lord's Prayer. Luther has the first phrase, and then he gives a little sermon on it. Our Father, thou in heaven above, who biddest us to dwell in love, yada, yada, yada. Then, all hallowed be thy name, O Lord. And then he goes on for seven lines. Thy kingdom come, seven lines. Thy will be done, seven lines. So I think in all it's, I can't remember how many stanzas it is. But it, it's actually, uh, and this has been set by many more composers than the, the chorale we just sang. Just out of curiosity, how many have sung the chorale we just did before? Okay, that's good. I didn't know. Is that in uh, hymnals or is it is it extant somewhere? It is. Okay. I I did I set that score. I couldn't find it anywhere when I wanted to analyze it. And these words might be a little different. I think I cribbed them from Catherine Winkworth somewhere. But uh, thank you very much. Sing. We're going to sing again. Am I leading this too? <laughs> oh, yeah, don't put away your handouts. Uh, oh, we have, uh, oh, it's up there. Okay. So this, um, this is best known as the Passion Chorale. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, I think in, in the hymnal we use at our church, which is the 1940 Episcopal Hymnal, I think it's listed as Passion Chorale. In 1940, the editors in the U.S. wanted to get rid of as many German words as they could. So they changed the tune names of a lot of hymns. It's like when we had Freedom Fries back when the French weren't helping us and something, get rid of French things. So there are a lot, but this is, uh, this is the tune name that uh, it shows up most because these are the first four words in German uh, of the... Uh, of, of one of the texts. Now, uh, I don't know how many times, I should know offhand how many times this chorale appears in the St. Matthew Passion, but I think each time it has different texts. It's known as, as the Passion Chorale because it's often, uh, oh, sacred head now wounded. Is, uh, and I thought, um, this is uh, a f probably a familiar text, but not to this tune. Uh, so, num a number of you have sung this text by Paul Gerhardt before, but it works well with this tune. So I thought this would be a nice way to end. And I'm actually going to sit down there so I can sing tenor instead of uh, standing up here and singing the melody. And uh, it, it, it's Sarah, right? Yeah, thanks. You're going to play this for us? Okay, thank you. Should we stand?
remind you that you're welcome to join us tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m. for another lecture from Ken Myers upstairs. So, and then tomorrow evening for the conclusion of this. But let me close this in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to be together. Bless us as we depart. Protect us. Give us good rest. Help us to delight, delight in the good gifts you've given to us, music and your word and the, the culture that uh, spreads that across centuries. Help us to give thanks for it, to appreciate it in new ways and spur one another on uh, to do the same. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening.